Acts chapter uh, 16, let's go ahead and read it. I want, I want you to see the whole story, uh, verses 11 to 40 together, and then we'll kind of walk back through and see what it is we're, we're supposed to understand here. Acts chapter 16, start at verse 11. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us, saying, if you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay, and she prevailed upon us. As we were going to the place of prayer, I think again, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers, and when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews, and they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore their garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was a great quake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into the house, set food before them, and he, re and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. When they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Now, let me, let me just remind us. So Paul's on this second missionary journey. He's kind of going backwards where he went before. He, it says at the beginning of chapter 16 that he, he really wanted to go down into what we know as Asia Minor, part of Turkey today. He was prevented by the Holy Spirit. He finds his way finally to Macedonia, to the city of Philippi. And there, I imagine, we don't know exactly, but Paul's probably there for several weeks. Things are going well. And, 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 and people are coming to faith so much so that when uh, he gets thrown in jail, one of the accusations is that, that they are, this group of people the, that have come are disturbing the whole city. I thought about that. I thought, no, that's not, no, they don't mean that as a compliment. They, they mean for that to be thrown into jail. But what a compliment that is through New Testament eyes. Would that it could be said of us that for the sake of the gospel, we disturb the whole city. That we were disturbing, like there, were, there was something, people were coming to faith, all kinds of people, so much so that it's a disruption, not, not because we're protesting or angry, because Jesus Christ is changing people's lives. I love that. They're disturbing the whole city. Now, people are getting saved. 
No doubt, and yet what Luke does here is very interesting. He decides he's going to pull out of that group of salvation three people, and it's almost like he's doing a case study in salvation, and he chooses a woman, a woman, a slave, and a Gentile. Now, that is not coincidental. It's not coincidental because an early Jewish man, like in Paul's day, one of the first prayers they would pray when they got up in the morning was, I thank you, God, that I'm not a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. And here's Luke going, well, let me show you your sense of privileged status. You, you think that because you're Jew, there's some sort of distinction God makes. And we've seen over and over in the book of Acts already this, this loud message, God makes no distinction between who you are ethnically or socioeconomically or any of these things. And now Luke seems bent on showing us exactly what he means. So he gives us these three cases. So I just want to walk through them. You've heard the story now. You heard the story of Lydia. You heard the story of the slave girl. You heard the story of the Philippian jailer. Now let's walk through. And all I want to do is ask kind of two questions. Who does God save and how does he save? Okay? So let's look at them. We'll kind of cycle through on both those. So let's first look at who God saves. And of course, we get to Lydia first. What do we know about Lydia? Well, Luke tells us a whole lot. He says, of course, she's a woman. He tells us she's Asian. That is, she is from uh, probably from the district of Lydia. Maybe that's where she got her name, the city of Thyatira. And so she, she's actually from Asia that Paul was forbidden to go into. She is a seller of purple. Uh, Thyatira was actually the center of that, of that uh, industry. And I know that sounds strange for us. Like, what does that mean? But, but it was very, very difficult to make purple dye in those days. You had to use a certain kind of shellfish and grind up and boil and do all these things. So, so it tended to be a very rare fabric. And so that meant that her clientele, if you will, were probably royalty and certainly the extremely wealthy. So that probably tells you something about Lydia. Lydia is probably a wealthy businesswoman. Okay, we don't know if she's married. Maybe she's single. We don't know, but we know she's wealthy. She owns a home. Maybe she owns one in Thyatira and one, you know, she's like she owns one in the mountains up at Arrowhead and out in the desert and down at the beach, right? She's got, she's a wealthy woman. And, and look at what, uh, what, what happens to her. Like God decides I'm going to reach down and I'm going to save her. But it says she's a worshiper of God. That's kind of a, a technical term we might say. She's spiritual, she's moral, she's religious. Uh, we might say here she is a woman with a Hebrew Bible trying to make sense of all these sacrifices, these kings, these prophecies. What does all this mean? I, I see God in here, but I'm not sure. So, I mean, here's a woman who has everything, but she's searching for something more, right? That's the idea. She, she's seeking, she's wanting something, and God decides, I'm, I'm going to reach her. See, religious people need the gospel, don't they? In fact, just as much, if not more, because sometimes religious people, and that would be many of us, perhaps even in this room, that we think we're closer to God because of our religious behavior. And Luke is showing us she's, she's not, but for the grace of God. Next, we run into this slave girl. She's most likely Greek, and let's just say it this way, she is the polar opposite of Lydia. Lydia is wealthy. This girl is abjectly poor. Now, let me say it in this, in this sense. She owns nothing. She has nothing. She, any money she makes is taken. She has no freedom. She has no liberty. She has no rights. She doesn't, can I say it? She doesn't even have a name. Isn't that interesting that Luke doesn't record for us. I know he does with the jailer too, but when we put these two in opposition to each other, right, it's like she's got nothing. She's a nobody. She is oppressed. She is abused. What we might say today, she's a victim of human trafficking. She's a prostitute on the streets of LA that's making money for her pimp. That, that, that's what's going on, but it's more than that. She's, she's tormented by spirits. Now, be careful, right? When you come, I think a lot of modern readers, we bring all of our modernity into reading Scripture. So what some of you want to do is take what the Bible will call a spiritual problem. It'll call demonic possession. It'll call spirit of divination, things like that, and we'll try to turn it into a mental disorder. The Bible knows the difference. 
I mean, a little boy has epilepsy, he'll say he has epilepsy. He doesn't just say he's got a demon, right? It, it understands there's a difference between physical and spiritual ailments. And here it specifically says this woman has a spirit. This girl, and, and probably this is a young girl, has a spirit of divination. In fact, by the way, that word literally in the Greek says she had the spirit of the python. That's weird, huh? The spirit of a python. Now, what does that mean? John Stott, uh, let, me, let me let him explain here. He says, the reference is to the snake of classical mythology which guarded the temple of Apollo. Apollo was thought to be embodied in the snake and to inspire pythonesses, his female devotees, with clairvoyance, although the other people thought of them as ventriloquists. So, okay, so, so what's Luke doing? Is Luke giving credence to tales of Apollo and, and these other Greek and Roman gods? No. No, but let me tell you what he does do. Just like if you and I were to go into a foreign country where there was, um, let's say, uh, overt idol worship. Pa Paul's going to say to the, to the Corinthians, he's going to say, an idol is nothing. But behind the idol is something. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, am I implying, talking about food offered to idols, I'm implying that food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything. No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. In other words, Paul's saying behind that wooden idol that seems like it's nothing, that golden idol, whatever, there's actually demonic things going on. I think this is exactly what Luke is saying. Behind this idea of the spear of the python is some real, sinister, demonic, activity happening in this little girl's life and she is abused and think about this she's doubly abused she's abused by her her owners you do what I say you make money for us we pimp you out and she's abused by a spirit that says I'm going to control you and, and, and I'm going to be inside of you and torment you I mean, we're supposed to feel pitiful. This is like, you're supposed to feel like compassion for this girl. This is horrendous what she's going through. So there's Lydia, there's, there's a slave girl, and then there's the Roman jailer. Now, now I, I, it's interesting to me, right? It's like Luke is doing, I want, to give you, I want to give you this sort of extreme example, if you will, of oppression, abuse, um, that kind of person. I want to give you somebody of privilege, of status, and right in the middle is this Philippian jailer, right? He's a government worker, probably comfortable middle class, you know, doing his work every day, going home, providing for his family. Uh, things are kind of going well for him. Seems like he's got a normal life, and truthfully, in that normalcy, what's the reason for God? He's kind of indifferent, perhaps, He's a jailer. I don't care if it's a Christian or non-Christian. I'll throw them all in jail. I'm just kind of indifferent to it all. And God decides, I'm going to do something with this guy. And all three of these become founding members of the Philippian church. That's amazing. Okay, so that, that's, that's who God saves. So, and I think, I think the point here is this is a broad spectrum. A woman, a slave, a, a, a Gentile, a man, right, young, old, economically, you know, destitute, e economically rich, somewhere in between all of this, God is, doesn't show favoritism. God, there's no partiality. There's no distinction. That's the idea. I want to see this in living color for all of us. But now, how God saves. How does he do this? This becomes an interesting case study to look through. Now, now, so let me just make some introductory comments. First of all, I want to show you how God saves. And if you will, I want, to, I want us to look through the eyes of, or, or several different perspectives. Let's say it that way. So, so I want to look at God's perspective. How, how does God save? I want to look at this from Paul's perspective. What's, what's, what's God doing from Paul's viewpoint in Philippi? And then finally, What's happening from the viewpoint of Lydia, of the slave girl, and of, of this Philippian jailer, okay? So let's look at it from God's perspective. And I want to just ask the question, why do some people, maybe this is you, why do some people believe in the gospel and they're saved, and why do some others not? Pretty simple question, right? You ever thought about that? If you're a believer, how come you're a believer, but your brother or sister isn't? How come you're a believer, but your friend isn't? How come you're a believer, but somebody else isn't? If you're not, like, well, what makes the difference? 
Well, let's talk about unbelief just for a moment. Um, because here's what the Bible, if I want to give you just a broad biblical answer to why some people don't believe, the answer is because they don't want to. Now, here's what I mean by that. The Bible is going to place the blame for lack of unbelief right at the feet of the unbeliever. So when you say they are responsible. If you have not believed in Jesus Christ, there's going to be no one but yourself to blame. That's how the Bible's going to talk. So let me, let me just give you really quickly. Uh, if, if we went back to Acts chapter 13, it says to Jews, thrust the message of the gospel aside. We, we don't want it. We have no desire for it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, Paul says people don't believe because the message of the gospel, he says, is folly to them and they're not able to understand. He tells the Romans that the mind of the flesh is hostile to God, Romans chapter 8, verse 7. He tells the Ephesians that unbelievers remain darkened in their understanding because of their ignorance that is in them, look at this, due to their hardness of heart. But that ignorance is a guilty ignorance because, Romans chapter 1, verse 18, by their understanding, unrighteousness, they're ignorant. They suppress the truth. In other words, the one to blame is the unbeliever. There will be nobody else to blame. Now, here's the hard part. If that's true, if, if the blame lies there, then does that mean that the credit is also with the believer? Hey, I believed, so I get the credit. No. Let me say it to this way and let me explain. You get all the, uh, all the blame for not believing God will get all the credit if you do believe. How do those things work together? If I could tell, if I tell you that, I, I, I would be God. I, I don't know. That's the truth. But this is what the Bible teaches. So for example, like we can just walk through the book of Acts. Acts chapter 11, verse 18, it says that God granted repentance to the Gentiles. This is what the, the, the Jews are looking and saying, oh my goodness, God's done this. Like he's given this gift of faith to the Gentiles. So, so now they can believe too. It's a gift of God. Acts chapter 13, verse 48, it says all those who were appointed to eternal life believed. Appointed by whom? By God. And so they believed because they were appointed. And then we get here to Acts chapter 16 and verse 14. We hear about Lydia and it says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. How did Lydia come to faith? God opened her heart. So God must overcome the resistance that's embedded in the human heart. That's how somebody comes to faith. And you will not come to faith apart from that. You will remain in unbelief. So God's ultimately responsible. See, some people are offended. Some people are offended that I talk like that, that I, I'm just quoting Scripture here, right? I'm just showing you this is what Scripture says because they say that means, because they, they think the logical conclusion of what you're saying, Chris, is if God is the one who's determining, that means if God elects some to eternal life, he's also electing somebody to eternal damnation. So you're saying God sends people to hell. No, I am not. The Bible never says God sends anyone to hell. It says you send yourself to hell. I don't understand. Neither do I. Except that's how the Bible talks. That God gets all the credit. We get all the blame. And only God knows how that works. That's, that's, that's God's perspective, okay? Now, now, let's look at Paul's perspective. This is what I mean. Like, is Paul sort of analyzing? Okay, Paul goes, I'm gonna go. Hey, church in Antioch, here I go. I'm gonna go out from among you, take a group of people with me, Travis, and I'm gonna plant a church. <laughs> now, Travis, bear with me here. Like, nothing goes according to plan. Seriously. Paul goes, we're going, I wanna do this in Asia. Nope, resisted by the Holy Spirit. Spirit of Jesus holds him out. All right, then we're going to go to Philippi. We get there. All right, he probably looks around for a Jewish synagogue. Okay, that didn't happen. So now let's go down by the river to pray. I think I'm going to pray, interrupted by a group of women. And now he has this conversation. Somebody comes to faith, right? He thinks, all right, well, good. I'll, I'll, I'll plant a church here. I want to go. I'm going to be free to get out here and speak the gospel to people, only to be harassed by a demonically possessed slave girl. He wants to plant a church in Philippi, only to be thrown in jail. Nothing is going according to Paul's strategic plan for church planning in Philippi. 
but it's all going to God's plan. That's why we talked about this last week. Do do, do you see this? Christian, listen, we have to have a view of God's sovereignty that says when I'm interrupted, when my plans are thwarted, when things aren't going my way, God is absolutely, totally still in control, accomplishing exactly so that he who began a good work will complete it, right? That for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Do you believe that? everything. God's going, you know, you can't see it, Paul. I know this is frustrating, but I'm at work, and I am building my church in very unexpected ways. Praise God. Praise God. Okay, so that's God's perspective, Paul's perspective, kind of frustration. This is not happening according to plan. Now let's kind of get into the eyes of the last three, of Lydia, of the slave girl, and the Roman soldier. Let's get through the eyes of Lydia. Now what would we say if we're Lydia, how did you come to faith? She might say something like this, just an ordinary, regular conversation. We're down there by the river. I'm with a bunch of women. We decide we're going to go down there maybe to pray. We're going to talk about this scripture that none of us really, not because they're women, they're just like, they don't... I don't understand it. I'm reading about kings. I'm reading about, about, you know, blood sacrifices. I'm reading about all these kind of, you know, prophecies. I don't know how to make sense. Long comes this guy. He strikes up a conversation with me. And in the midst of that conversation, I hear for the first time, this is what that all means. And I start to put two and two together and I believe and I'm saved. That's her perspective. Now, Now, by the way, look at verse 14 again. It says, this is Lydia, it says, the end of verse 14, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Let's just take that kind of word at a time. The Lord, who's who's the key factor in her salvation? Is it Paul's ability to convince her? Is it Paul wowing her with his oratory? It's God. Listen, church. The deciding factor in every salvation is God. We don't save, I don't save, Paul doesn't save, Billy Graham never saved anyone. Hear me? God did it. In fact, Jesus is going to say, just to make sure we don't get it wrong, John chapter 6, he's going to say, no one comes to me. He says it twice in one chapter. No one comes to me unless the Father draws him. You, you didn't, Jesus says to disciples, you would have never chosen me if I hadn't chosen you, right? You got to understand how this goes. I'm, I'm the one doing the drawing. It's the Lord. What happened though? The Lord opened her heart because what's our problem? Our problem, Paul said it, Ephesians, is a hardness of heart. We need new hearts. We have to have hearts that go from unbelief to belief, right? We have hearts that are closed off to the truth. This is why the Old Testament will talk. And maybe Paul said, hey, guess what, Lydia? If I take you back to the, to the prophet Ezekiel, I take you back to the prophet Jeremiah, it says there's coming the day, declares the Lord, but I'm going to take out the heart of stone, put in a heart of flesh, and now I'm going to write the law in your heart, and now you're going to want to obey. Now there's going to be a desire inside of you, and you're going to want to follow this. And Paul starts to put two and two together. And God opens her heart to do what? To pay attention, to listen to Paul, to give ear, to go, this is, this is like, I bet most people in this room who say, if I can look back to the day I became a Christian, a message that perhaps I'd heard a hundred times, maybe the first time, I'd heard over and over again, heard it for years, finally, It's like I was zeroed in. This is talking to me right now. God is opening my heart to believe. And then what happened? Open her heart to pay attention to what Paul said. Now, what did Paul say? Well, I I don't think it's a stretch at all. In fact, I think this is the only conclusion we can come to is he, he just preached the gospel. Now, here's what I mean by that. It wasn't four spiritual laws. God has a wonderful plan for your life, Lydia. I think it's him taking her back to the Old Testament and saying, Lydia, let's go back. Look at what happened in the garden. 
Look at how we rebelled. Now, now we've, we've, the, the, the first Adam failed. The second Adam, Jesus Christ. Let me show you how he fulfills everything that Adam. Adam failed in the moment of eating a piece of fruit. Jesus succeeds in the moment of being tempted by food. I mean, he goes back and he looks at the kings and says, man, they were longing for a king who could never, ever seem to get it right. Finally, a king comes along that will sacrifice himself and his agenda for the sake of his people. He, he, he goes back and shows them the blood sacrifice. Every single one of those pointed forward to this man, Jesus, who finally died and paid for all the sins, never have to pay for them again. Lydia, this is the truth. And God in that moment says, I've seen, he, she's been looking at this, maybe studying it, trying to figure it out, can't see it. How many of you remember those pictures? Like, they're like, like 15 years ago, remember those pictures that were popular? You'd stare at them, but you couldn't tell me, like, there's a butterfly. I can't see it, right? I'm like, oh, uh, I got to get my focus just right. And if, oh, there it is, right? It's like moment of epiphany. It's like the gospel. I could not see what was right there in front of my eyes until God opened my eyes and I saw. That's what's happening. God gives her eyes to pay attention to what's being said by Paul. And Lydia becomes the first convert in all of Europe. Listen, listen to me. Maybe there's a Lydia in your life. Maybe just an ordinary conversation at the office at school, to a neighbor, sitting on an airplane, or maybe your plans are interrupted, but God says, I'm setting the Lydia right next to you. All that you got to do, all that's left for me is just to preach the gospel. Notice that. What was said by Paul? Listen, the, the, the gospel is indispensable. My testimony is dispensable. Do you understand that, Christian? I think sometimes we're embarrassed by the gospel. Somehow I got to make this more attractive. Somehow I got to talk about here's what Jesus has done in my life. That's great what Jesus, but my testimony saves no one. What saves people is the bloody death of God on a cross for your sins to satisfy what God the Father required so that now you can be reconciled to God. Now that's why Paul says this feels moronic. That's literally the word he uses, folly. It's crazy. People go, no, no, so I want to dress it up. Paul says, no, here's what they need. Every person who's not saved needs the gospel. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, what you need is the gospel. What you need is to listen to somebody who preach the gospel. What you need, let me just say this, is to walk in the back there, ask somebody, can I have a Bible? We will give you a Bible. Go home, hear me, go read the book of John. Perhaps... In reading the Gospels, in reading the book of John, perhaps God will cause you to pay attention to what's being said in Scripture and you'll believe. That's how it happens every time. If you are a Christian, I, I want to reinstill in you a confidence in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. It's still the power of God for salvation for all who believe not your testimony. That's wonderful. Praise God. That's ancillary. That's not primary. Preach the gospel. That's Lydia. Just an ordinary conversation. The second one is a slave girl. And we might say, this is a power encounter. So let's look at, let's talk about Lydia just for a second again. Lydia's primary need was intellectual. If I can say it that way. I don't, I don't mean to say it's not a spiritual need. Just understand what I'm saying. I just need an ordinary conversation that's going to help explain this gospel thing to me, explain how this Old Testament works, and now I'll believe. You've got a girl here, this slave girl. Her issue, can I say it this way, is uh, spiritual, experiential, psychological. I don't mean by that that her problem is just a psychological problem. I mean, if you're tormented by demons, if you are owned by another person, you will have psychological problems, right? Is that fair? And so what does she need? She needs to be set free. And so what happens? Paul comes along and says, man, uh, all right, so... so uh, we got to do something about this. She needs the power of the Spirit. She, listen, I think, by the way, uh, you notice how 
She, she encounters Paul and then for several days following him around saying, these men are servants of the most high God and they're preaching to you the way of salvation. Let me say to you something about demonic oppression or possession and control. It doesn't mean that on the day you are demonically possessed, let's say, that you fall into a trance and let's say that lasts for several years. You wake up and say, what happened the last several years? You're, 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 you're awake. Maybe this girl knows something is terribly wrong and I am powerless to extricate myself from this. And maybe, can I say it this way? Maybe those words, by the way, they're exactly correct, aren't they? They're servants of the Most High God and they proclaim to you the way of salvation. And maybe that's a cry of a desperate girl and maybe that's the cry of a demon who wants to discredit Paul and his companions, right? I, I, I want to associate you with the whack jobs. I want to associate you with demonic and the occult. And Paul says no. And greatly annoyed, notice what he does. He speaks to the spirit. This is interesting that Luke points this out. He's not annoyed with this girl. I, th I think he's broken hearted. And he says he speaks to the Spirit, says, come out of her. And it's gone. That's a power encounter. Sometimes this is how God saves people. I think we're meant to see that this girl is a Christian. That he supernaturally intervenes and rescues her out of this for the sake of his kingdom. Um, so, so, so look, Lydia, wealthy, respected, religious, moral, sort of gets saved in this quiet, serene environment down by a river, just an ordinary conversation. The slave girl, poor, oppressed, exploited, abused, she's out in the open. It's this dramatic encounter. And listen to me, I think this means there's hope for all of us. If God can deliver a little girl from demonic possession, can he free you from your addiction? Does he have the power to overcome your anxiety and your depression and the things you walk around with day after day that seem like I'm powerless to control this? He's Lord over everything. Believe it. That's a slave girl. Last one is the jailer. What happens here? Look at how he's saved. If you were to say to him, hey, how are you saved? He'd go, man, it was, let's say it this way, through the winsome witness, through the practical witness of what I saw in these men inside this jail. See, see again, he sees, if, if, I can, if I'm accurately summarizing this guy and he's kind of indifferent to all this, you got this godly, kind of God-fearing worshiper of God who's not yet a Christian, who's religious, you've got this, you know, demon-possessed in the middle stands sort of the indifferent secularist who says, I really don't care because I don't see the relevance and along comes Paul, and they say, throw this guy in jail, and there they are, shackled behind closed doors. What would you expect? They've been beaten with rods. Now, just to stop there. Like, don't, don't run over that. Somebody takes a broomstick handle and beats you with it 50 times, 40 times. How are you feeling right now? So, so you'd expect, you'd expect if you're the jailer to be sitting there and hearing this, oh, 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 right? What does he hear? Praise God from whom all blessings. Like this is mind blowing. I heard Rosario Butterfield, some of you know that name, radically saved, absolutely rejected all things Christian. And a um, man invites her in who's a, a, a pastor. She wants to research why Christians are wrong about homosexuality in the Bible and that sort of thing. And so she, she ends up befriending a, a, a local pastor and 
going to his home, kind of very skeptical. And, and, and truthfully, she didn't hear it for a long, long time. She, she heard, but she didn't hear, right? She, she saw, but didn't see. And I heard her talk one time and says that, I'll tell you what made a huge difference was watching how they suffered. So, see, we think, Christian, that, man, if the world can see us just living these great lives, moral lives, good lives, this is what will become attractive to them. But you know what makes the most of Jesus? Is when they see us suffer and we don't walk away. When they see us suffer and say, this is the resource. Like Jesus is everything. <laughs> That's when we make much of Jesus. The Philippian jailer hears this. He sees this. He runs in and says, okay, who does this? Right? And by the way, notice the, the, the earth shakes. Their shackles come off. The doors fly open. Now I'm Paul. I'm thinking, sign from God. Run. <laughs> right? They've done this before. Peter did that. The angel comes, slaps him. Peter, get up. Come on, let's go. Not this time. Paul stays. Why? Isn't that weird? Let, let me give you, I think, two reasons. One's a very practical reason that you see in verses 35 through 40. Paul understands that if he just leaves quietly and, and gets out of the city and they escape, that, that Philippian community of believers will suffer under continuing persecution. So he's like, no, I'm going to stay for the sake of them. But I think he stays for another reason. I think he knows exactly what will happen. They know exactly what will happen to that jailer if they run. Now, who stays in bondage for the sake of somebody else? Who suffers so that somebody else might live? You see what I mean? Talk about a winsome witness. This is what opens the Philippian jailer's heart to walk in and say, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, believe. Believe into Jesus Christ. Put the full weight of your trust in him. Explains the gospel. Perhaps. This is just the truncated version, perhaps, of what Paul said. He believes, he's baptized, his life is changed, his whole household is changed. This becomes the beginning of the Philippian church. Paul loves this church. Like, I think this is one of the beloved churches for Paul so that he writes to them in the book of Philippians, his letter to the Philippians, and he says this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He sends that letter. Now watch this. Somebody stands up and reads that letter. Maybe it was a little slave girl. Maybe it was Lydia. Maybe it was the Philippian jailer. Because God had created, through the gospel, a family so disparate, so weird, so, so different. But through the power of the gospel, this is the church that Jesus planted in the Philippi. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the power of the gospel. And I just pray. I pray for my friends here in this room right now. I pray for those who maybe they're religious, maybe they're oppressed, maybe they stand in that sort of secularist middle ground that just doesn't see any need for it, that, God, you'd open their eyes. Perhaps there'd be a conversation. Perhaps they've heard the gospel this morning. That however you decide to do that, God, we trust you, we thank you, and we pray that would happen today. But I also pray for those of us in this room who are Christian, who call upon the name of the Lord, who, who name Jesus Christ as our Savior, that, God, we would be confident once again that the gospel, and only the gospel, is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. And that it would be our goal as you, we find ourselves interrupted, as we find ourselves in regular conversations, as we find ourselves with people who have watched our lives and we have an opportunity to speak the truth of that gospel, I pray, God, even in our feeble attempts, open our mouths. 
Open our mouths, God, for the sake of your glory and for the sake of belief in Jesus Christ that many people might be saved through that. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And we ask this in Jesus' name.